um, I uh, wasn't quite sure what kind of pests you're going to run into, but I figured they're probably about the same as all of us run into. So first I'm going to just talk about the principles of integrated pest management, because this is the, the point of managing pests is we need to do, we, we need to avoid damage from the pests, but we want to do the least harm to anything else, <coughs> including us and our kids and the bees, etc. So um, the province of BC actually was a real um, nationwide leader in getting IPM established in legislation. So it was in the, it was about 19... Um, 96, I think, when we, that's when I worked in that, I worked for the Integrated Pest Management Unit in BC while we were changing the legislation. It used to be the Pesticide Control Branch and became the Integrated Pest Management Branch. So there's a, there's a definition in legislation, so I'm, I'm not going to bore you with that. The, the bottom line is, is that it's a, a decision-making process, and it's based on prevention. So it uses a combination of techniques, and we want to, Here's the key word, is suppress pests. We don't need to eliminate them off the face of the earth because that's not possible. And we need their predators to stay alive to exercise some control over them. And of course it has to be effective. I mean, if you're a grower, a uh, market grower or anything, that's really important. It's got to be economical and environmentally sound. So the main thing is, is that we take advantage of all these preventative and non-toxic ways to deal with it. Um, and get a sufficient level of control. And if we move to the pesticides that are allowed, these are the least toxic products. They're, they're like the last resort. They're way down the decision-making tree as being you know, the last things we do. So thinking about any pest problem, start with what can you do to avoid the problem. And then, that's actually not where most people start. Where we start is we have a problem. So the, problem that, the, the key there is to get it identified. We don't know what it is, there's nothing you can do. Um, and um, even when it's identified, monitoring, which I'll talk a lot more about all of these pieces, is how we tell whether it's a continuing problem, is it getting worse, is it getting better? <coughs> uh, a lot of things get better on their own because there's a lot of natural enemies, there's a lot of naturally occurring fungi on leaves that control other fungi, so things can go without any intervention from us, things can get better. And then, you know, it, are you actually getting crop loss? And do you really need to do anything? That's how we're going to we're going to think about that. And then, of course, there's a whole toolbox of things that we could try and use together. And then there's always the how did it go afterwards. <coughs> and then, then when, this is where we close the loop. You, you might start here with the problem, go through all of this. But next year, we want to start with prevention. So that's basically IPMs. Prevention is key. So. Um, Avoid stressing plants. Too much or too little water. Soil nutrients are really important. We're growing <coughs> agricultural crops. They have been selected by people to be very high uh, consumers of food and water. They need nutrients and water more than any landscape plants or lawns. If you're, gross, if you're used to growing anything other class of plants, these are not like that. I always tell people the first thing to remember is vegetables are little pigs. They need a lot, and they need it all the time. So the wrong P, soil pH, all of these things contribute to uh, nutrients not being available. Of course, poor planting and, and pruning techniques, competition with weeds, extreme weather, which you can't control, but you can mitigate. You can put shade cloth on things when it's too hot. You can throw a tarp over something when it's a frosty night. If, if, uh, if you don't have a, a way to pH your water, like. What do you do in your garden? Like check your water pH. Yeah. Well, water well I know pH. how to check water pH. Yeah. Like, oh, you what, mean the soil pH? No, no. What if your water pH is off, but you don't have a way to change what's coming into your yard? You know, water pH isn't going to be that far away from neutral. There is, it, it, it varies a little, but it's not like soil, which can vary. Our native soils can be way down at 5.4. Mm -hmm. If you lived in Saskatchewan, you're worried about 8. Point something. I'm 7.2 out of my tap. Yeah, well that's fine. You know, that's well within the, uh, the zone where vegetables grow well anyway. So nothing that you, so the water wouldn't uh, cause any damage. <coughs> that's our... That's your soil? Soil analysis. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, you look like you've got plenty of nutrients. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the thing about nitrogen 
in a soil test is you never really know how much of that the plants are going to get to use. It's almost always nitrogen that's the issue in terms of growth. Because if you're using organic methods and you're using <coughs> compost, and you're using some of those complete organic fertilizers and rock dusts and things, they have so many other nutrients in them, minerals and elements, that deficiencies are not really an issue for most of that. It's just getting enough nitrogen. High rainfall area, nitrogen is always having to be replaced. So that's usually, the, that's usually it. And so I wouldn't worry about your water pH at all. Um, but, you know, when you have stressed plants, you know, they, can, they are more susceptible to diseases, especially suck, and especially sucking and boring insects. Boring insects in trees and aphids and um, similar sucking insects um, can get sap easier out of plants that are slightly drought stressed. Plants are so drought stressed they're completely wilted, they can't. But I used to work for a company that produced biological controls. and. I mean, if you're going to raise aphid predators, you have to be incredibly good at raising aphids first. And uh, we always turned our water off in the greenhouses. We use pepper plants as the aphid host. We turned the water off in the middle of the day and let the plants just go from like nice, complete, you know, to just a little bit of wilting. And that, and the aphid populations would explode because that was the way to grow aphids. So that is the way to not grow aphids in your you know, your uh, crops. And some of the things we do, if we plant trees, like a fruit tree, and leave the roots curling around as they came from the pot or the burlap, when that tree gets older, those roots get wider and wider, and the tree strangles itself. So you might be watering all you can, and the tree is strangling itself, so it's actually drought stressed. So we have to, you know, some of these problems go right back to how we planted something. So when we get heat and drought together, um, then plants are really in trouble. They can, they can survive drought, they can survive heat if they have a lead time, but when, it's, when they're dry and hot together, plants close the stomata in the leaves up. They, the pores in the leaves that let in the carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and water is evaporating out, they close those to conserve moisture when, it gets, when, they, get, when, they, when they start getting worried that they're going to have a disastrous loss of moisture. But as soon as they do that, the cool, it's like shutting the air conditioning off. Suddenly leaf temperature really leaps. Also, plants can't get food anymore, obviously, from the soil because <coughs> there's no transpiration, there's no evaporation. So no, none of the soil nutrients are moving up into the roots and through the plant. So we have, if we have prolonged periods where they can't um, photosynthesize, can't get nutrients from the soil and they're overheating, we add starvation onto heat injury. So we get, um, when you see damage that looks, a lot of different kinds of plants have similar damage, then you know that's something wrong with the environment, such as heat and drought together, irrigation or water. If it's one particular plant, the kind of plant looks bad, one family of plants, it's possible it's disease, but when it's all sorts of families having the sim similar symptoms, Pathogens are very specific, host specific. If it's if the onions are diseased, it's not going to go on the beans. You know, the beans are have fungus on them. They're not. It's not going on tomatoes or anything. So we have a couple of metabolic disorders. Um, you might be wondering why I'm talking about plant growth problems in a pest management section. And the reason I'm doing it is because most of what causes our crop losses are things wrong with the growing conditions, whether it's the way you irrigate it or the weather or nutrients. It's actually most of the materials that go to plant diagnostic labs, like the one in Abbotsford, the Ministry of Agriculture one, they turn out not to be pests or diseases. They turn out to be what they call environmental disorders, um, growing condition problems <coughs> or injury, frost injury and stuff. And this is one where these look disgusting. I mean, this looks really looks diseased, but it's blossom end rot. That is a metabolic problem in the tomato. It didn't get calcium into the cells in that tomato as it was growing. But the reason it didn't get calcium is usually because the water, uh, there wasn't enough water in the soil. Or maybe the, the, you often see it in potted tomatoes where the soil gets dry and somebody comes from, from, from work at the end of the day and gives them a big soaking. Well, that irregular watering um, has made an interruption in the calcium supply, and calcium moves really slowly in plants. So the, a nitrogen might be moving right along, and the calcium isn't getting there. 
And so for, temp for a period of time, that tomato is having a calcium deficiency, nothing to do with a calcium deficiency in the soil. You might have plenty of calcium in the soil. This is caused by growing conditions. And this is a, this is a very similar problem at Bitter Pit in apples. It's a growing condition problem. Same kind of thing, interruptions in water, not enough water. Those are calcium deficiencies in the cells that cause them to die mm. in the fruit. This I've also had, has to do with heat and drought. I've had that a couple times in my apples. I yeah, what kind of apple? Do you know what variety? King one? apple. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say Kings, Gravensteins, John of Golds are really susceptible to this. Mm. I have a little tree at home that has three varieties on it. One's a John of Gold, one's a Spartan, and one's a Gala. They're on the same tree, and the, and the John of Gold gets bitter pit. Mm. Uh, but they're more prone to it, not in every year, and I'm probably not watering enough for it. But uh, no, they're, yeah, they're very prone to it. That's weird because that one's right beside my garden and it gets my overspray from my garden. So yeah. I, and, every, well, and when it's on really dry days, I go with the hose. I thought that for sure. Well, it yeah. might not be getting the water deep enough. And uh, the other thing is, is, remember I said it was an imbalance in the way they grow. Yeah. Um, the problem with the John of Gold particularly is the fruit's huge. And when apples get big, they grow so fast, the calcium can't get there fast enough. So when a plant, uh, like a tree, an apple tree, is shuttling calcium around inside, the leaves get it first. They, they get the call on the calcium that the tree has first, and the fruit gets it. That's the physiologically the way the plant works. And so if the apples are growing really fast, which it could be actually too much moisture, or maybe nitrogen sources, or it's just a variety thing. I think my John would just like to be huge apples. Yeah. Um, that causes this the lag in the calcium. You can't catch up with the cells. So maybe you need to slow down on how fast that tree grows. You know, maybe maybe you maybe you might be too much water. You might think about that. I mean, your apples get pretty big. I think probably. They're, do they? they're like that's that's the that's the John Gold problem. So try and slow that tree down so I the apples. That. Well, not too much water, and make sure, are you putting compost or anything on the soil? Uh, no. Okay, good. It probably doesn't need it, you know. It's, it's a okay. fairly established tree. Yeah, it's Early fine. 15, so just ba maybe back off on the water. During fruiting, uh, is it a standard size tree, a big, big tree? Or? I keep pruning, I keep it pretty small. I can pick it basically almost from the ground. Yeah, but I'm wondering how big the root system might be. Do you know if it was a grafted tree to begin with? I was there when I bought it. Yeah, and my old my old uh, gravity scene was like that. So, uh, probably it's a standard root. So in that case, during fruiting only, you probably need to water once a week, like as the fruit's ripening. But you probably don't need any water um, up till that point okay. on an established tree. So I would I back off. Yet, huh? I haven't watered it yet. It's just flowers. Yeah, but... I'd back right off, and when the when the apples are actually ripening, just make sure if it's really hot and dry that it gets some drink. Uh, because that is how the fruit grows. That's why I'm saying it's one of these things that's really complicated. It's an interaction between what we do and what the weather's doing mm -hmm. and the characteristics of the plant. <laughs> because obviously, Gravenstein's and John and Gold's and King's love to get big. Yeah. On the same tree, my Spartan and Gallas never have, yeah. ever have bitter pit. Yeah. No yeah. other tree on my property does, but that one does. Yeah. Yeah, I had an old, I had another place I used to live, I had an old Gravenstein. I loved that tree dearly, but it drove me crazy. It was so hard to manage. Um, so extreme weather is also starting to really bite. Um, you know, I mean, I started, I came out here 30, more than 30 years ago, 32 years ago, oh my God. And um, it's not as easy to garden vegetables and manage fruit trees here now, because the, the, the flip-flops in the weather patterns are more extreme. Uh, which means it's harder on plants because they plants can adapt to cool weather as long as it happens gradually and they can adapt to hot weather as long as it happens gradually but when it flips like we can get 32 30 or 32 degree days in may early may when plants have been used to a cool spring we can get a nice warm fall and then suddenly early january it's super cold kind of like december cold and the trees haven't hardened off so it's when things happen really quickly that is the worst for, for plants. So the, the, the polar jet stream is slowing down, and that's what's giving us um, extended periods. What, what instead of like a two-day heat wave or an Arctic outbreak for three or four days, it'll hang in here like February. It hung in here and hung in here. Well, there was a big loop in the jet stream because it's weaker now. So if it's high-pressure systems that are delivering heat waves or 
cold air mass from the Arctic that's sitting there like a cold, big cold blanket. It just doesn't move. So we were, we are getting these extended periods that are even they're really causing damage. So you just need to be more alert as as a grower that these conditions can hang in there and try and be ready for that. Be ready for it before it happens. And of course, more wind. You guys are familiar with wind, but more wind. Um, you know, the average temperatures are increasing globally, but it's the extremes that are really biting on us as far as growing crops and um, you know, making sure we have market production that's, that's predictable. Yeah, I, I don't know, how many people were living around here in 215? Do you remember that summer? Tofino yeah. ran right out of water. A lot of our coastal communities, no water. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at University of Victoria, the climate uh, change consortium there, the models that they run, they consider that the average summer in another 20 or 30 years. And that was, a, that was an awful summer. How did they deal with the shortage of water? How do we? How did they? How who? And then? The Fino and Oh, they were trucking in water. The resorts were all closing. People were canceling weddings. It was a big mess. Wow. Um, I was on Salt Spring, and we were squeaking. But we had, yeah. and our lake levels went so low that they had to go and ask the Ministry of Environment for permits to use more lake water because they were well below their allowed. The levels had fallen below their allowed things, but the streams had gone dry. It depends on which community, where they got their water on Vancouver Island, but it was just ridiculously difficult. And that year, the rain started in September. Some years the rains don't start till the end of October. Mm -hmm. And Vancouver was sucking mud just about the time the rain started. Their reservoirs were so dry, but mm -hmm. they, they got lucky, you know. But <coughs> that's, if that's the average summer, we're gonna have to really up our game in terms of collecting Water conserving water. Yeah, we're trying to make that legal. Yeah. Rain collecting. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> heat and and heat too. And that was a, there were some really extended heat waves that summer. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was living in my basement most of the summer. It's cool down there. It's like you know down there watching Netflix. Oh my God. <laughs> Get anything done. So weird weather. Weather is the new normal. So we, this we have to live with. I mean, this is a fact of life. So I mean, we had the coldest February on record. And we set heat records in that March this year. And the coldest February on record means nothing because it's going to be another one of the hottest years, well, average temperature for the year. So, uh, and so our dream of growing bananas on the coast has gone out the window because we can get these long, prolonged cold waves that'll sit on us. I've, I've you know, when I first started doing um, gardening around Victoria, in the 80s, it was really easy to keep your winter vegetables all winter. I never covered them. I never did anything. And when I moved to Salt Spring, which was 18 years ago, it was still easy. I mean, I'm a little cooler there. I'm up a mountain, but um, I didn't fuss with anything. And now I have, you know, I'm building frames and I'm covering things and I'm doing stuff to get it through the winter. I, my, my climate moved on me. My winter experience, there's uh, colder weather. So just be aware of that. Now the next thing in prevention is don't bring in problems. Two really serious problems that you can get in a field and you can basically never get out again is club root on cabbage, which is a, uh, people call, used to call it a fungus, but it's really an amoeba. And they have a dormant stage that can stay 20 to 40 years in the soil without any cabbage family being grown. So once you get it, you got it. And the only way you get it, and it's the same with white rot, which is an onion and garlic disease, is you bring it in on infected plant material. So if you always grow things from seed, you're never going to get these diseases because they don't, they don't just fly around in the air like fungus, uh, fungus diseases. They are in the soil and they come on um, plants that might have it. Um, sometimes they can come on runoff from other fields that have it. But... If you're careful of growing your own material from seed or you're buying plants that have grown, someone else has grown, but they're grown in seed, soilless mixes, you're fine. Where people run into trouble is, especially in community gardens, people are always giving each other plants. Here, here's my little garden, you know, and they move it all around and no, you can't see it, right? And then um, you've got club root and you've basically got it forever. So quite rot. You, you bring it in on infected garlic cloves or 
you know those bunched onions? Have you seen the sweet onions in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, plant nurseries, Walla Walla Sweet Cell? Mm -hmm. They grow them in the field, wash the roots off, put a rubber band around it, and ship it. Those come from Washington State, and they have a lot of white rot in those fields. I would never buy those onion seedlings and put them in my soil. I think the risk is way too great. You can grow your own seedlings, you can get sets that are cleaner, you, there's a lot of other approaches, but that particular product is really risky hmm. for bringing in onion uh, diseases. What if you what if you seeded a plant that had it, would the seeds be? They would be fine. If it survived to produce seeds, it's not seed born. Okay. So you so this is why you're always safe when you grow <laughs> seeds or go, get seed that was grown in soilless mix because it's got to be spread around on the soil that's in the roots of things or on the actual infected plant material. So no, you're fine. So you know, inspect things, grow certified uh, potato uh, seed, seed potatoes, certified disease free, uh, grow your own stock. Um, you've, you've probably had this, but I'll just review it because it's a, I think it's a really good lesson. It actually applies to more than just plant disease, but here's the old plant disease triangle. You only get a diseased plant when you have three things and they all have to be in place at the same time. The plant has to be able to catch the disease, the organism that causes it has to be present, and that still isn't enough to have a diseased plant. The conditions have to be right for the organism to attack. So if you have late blight spores floating around in the environment, which at the end of the season we often do where potatoes are being grown, and you've got tomato plants, you've got two of these, <coughs> you've got the disease organisms in the plant, but until the tomato leaves are wet, you actually wet with free water on the leaf, you don't have an environment where those spores can germinate. So you can grow tomatoes, and if you can keep the leaves dry for the whole summer, you'll never have late blight. So this is what I mean by going back to prevention. It's uh, if you know how these things, what they need, and you take, you only need to remove one leg of this three-legged stool and you don't have a diseased plant. So over here, this is what a pea, this is an aphid on peas. Aphids spread a disease called a nation, uh, what's it called? Pea nation mosaic virus. No, a nation mosaic virus. Um, uh, but there are varieties of peas that are readily, we can buy them anywhere here, um, that, don't, that are resistant. So now we've just removed the susceptible plant. How are they resistant? Um, they've selected it to be resistant. They don't, get, they don't get the virus, so. Not like GMO. Oh no, 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 these are, no, this is garden vegetables and, and crops. They, and they're not even hybrids because you don't get hybrid peas, but they are, they've been checked and tested. I mean, a lot of, Varieties have natural resistance to things, and then a screening program at a university or you know, a research station, they'll just grow a lot of varieties and see which ones don't get the disease. I know I was just in Port Alberni, and um, there's a lot of uh, tulip blight in the tulips. In wet weather, it's a kind of botrytis, but it's really uh, ineffective. I mean, it just gets into all those sorts of tulips. But I was at a community garden, or sorry, their botanical garden, they have all kinds of tulips planted, and there's whole rows of ones that are blighted, and, you know, they're really disgusting. And the row right beside it of a different variety of tulip is beautiful. You're standing up, there's no disease at all. And so that's basically it. You go through and you say, well, we'll breed from these tomatoes, or, uh, or tulips, or we'll whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, West Coast Seeds has both, uh, um, pod peas and snap pea varieties, and sugar peas, that um, don't get this virus. So that's a prevention. You just take the susceptible plant out of the equation. I'm scared. <clears throat> what do the peas look like, the diseased peas? Are they, oh, I've got, got, you know what, I've got a slide in a moment here. They're kind of, yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it's. Really dry hmm. looking shell, like desiccated spots. Well, they're a bit distorted. The pods are distorted, and there's marks on the, on the, on the, um, Leaves. Well, I think I've got a picture here in a moment. Mm -hmm. Here, actually, now that you mention it, <laughs> right here. So the pods are kind of, I call them wibbly. You know, they're they're warty a bit. And there's these these. I think this is why they call it a mosaic virus. There's little yellow and silver marks in the in the leaves, and the leaves are a bit distorted too. And eventually, the plant just is stunted, stops growing. So, <coughs> so, so choosing disease resistant material. Whether it's apples or pears that don't get scab disease, which is a fungus disease, 
Um, you know, a wet spring, scab spreads really fast. So it's really worth it to look into disease-resistant apples if somebody's planting an orchard because it, it takes out a whole big pest problem that you don't have to deal with in future of the lifetime of those trees. Uh, but here's a zucchini growing in the middle of a patch of those squash that are getting powdery mildew, but this zucchini is resistant to powdery mildew. Okay, some ways of changing the disease environment are to, to change the environment around the plant. I mean, this isn't feasible on, on you know, you're not going to do this on three acres. But if you have a row of peach trees, you can keep, if you can keep them from getting wet in February, when people build these peach porches, and, and you know, British gardeners used to do this on these huge walled gardens, these big acreages. They would run all the peaches along all the walls, and then they just had an overhang that stuck out like this with glass. It was like not a greenhouse on the rest of it. And that, they were just called peach porches. So that's a way to prevent peach leaf curl because uh, that infects the buds as they're swelling in, in February, even though the leaves go on all summer looking weird and infected, it's actually infection happened at that one short period of time. That's not so feasible. But this is the, my example on, on tomatoes. People are, around this region have now taken to growing tomatoes in big open tunnels. The problem here is if you put a tomato in a tunnel or a greenhouse and there's condensation that builds up at night and it rains down on the leaves, the leaves are wet. So this is keeping off the rain, but you might make the matters worse if you have condensation. So they build these tunnels very open, they can roll the sides up, so you basically have a rain shelter. Now our summers are so dry for the middle part that most of the time people get away with their tomatoes fine, but come fall. If, the, if they get rained on, or your irrigation is such that you're always getting the leaves wet. That's when late blight really strikes. And I, I kind of harp on late blight because um, when the plants get infected, it's game over within a few days. It's a fast-moving, fatal disease. Whereas a lot of these diseases, I mean, squash will go along with powdery mildew all and still produce and manage and grow. There's almost nothing else that's fatal. And, and it's over as it is with uh, as late blight. And um, the same principle applies to pruning fruit trees, uh, all kinds of fruit trees. If you've got uh, open pruning and you want to get light into the fruit, yes, but one of the reasons for doing the, the pruning methods like that is to get the leaves to dry out quickly after a rain. Because the environment for, so let's say apple scab, this is an apple scab picture, Apple scab, I don't exactly remember how many hours it takes when the leaves are wet for the spores to germinate. But warmer it, warmer it is, the fewer hours. So there's a, you know, commercial growers have a table. If you look in the crop guide for apples, there'll be a table that says so many hours of leaf wetness at this temperature or this temperature for the spores to germinate. Well, what if you prune the tree so that after it rains or if you have overhead irrigation, the leaves dry out with in a shorter period of time than the spores need to germinate, then you don't get the disease. This is an apple tree I have. This is the apples on the top of the tree, nice up in the sun. This a tree was up against a fence at the time, it had you know wire fence and a lot of weeds. It was a short, it was a dwarf tree. This was the branches down where it was wet. Same tree. Apple scab is so bad on this fruit that it had to be picked off because the apples couldn't even grow. And look at this. Same tree. So it isn't um, a trivial prevention. It's really important. If you have open foliage so that the leaves dry off quickly, the fungus diseases just don't get enough time of wet leaf material to germinate. And then, you know, anytime, you've got to protect bark if you're doing fruit trees and stuff. I, I get really frustrated with espalier efforts here because People tie them up to wires and then the wires rub and then your European canker gets in if it's apples or pears or bacterial blight gets in if it's cherries or peaches um, or plums. So be really careful on this kind of thing. String trimmers, you whack them with the weed eater, <coughs> the bark, the bottom, or rubbing from supports or anything. Just be really careful about that because the bark, excuse me, the bark prevents disease in uh, organisms from getting in, and once you compromise that, make a hole in the bark, then it can get infected. So those are all prevention. 
So now, where do we start when we think we have a problem? Well, make sure things are correctly identified. This is a Brussels sprout plant. Does anybody recognize this? You've seen this? This is distorted bluish. Have you seen this on things? Maybe last year. I don't know if you were in the program last year or if you were around, but. I'm blind, it's hard to see. Yeah, it is hard to see. And you know what? Most people guess that it's a disease, but it's actually uh, one or two aphids on the underside of the leaf here are feeding on that plant, and the leaf is reacting by making this distorted bluish um, effect. And unless you knew that was insects, you might think it was a disease problem. It's not a disease problem, it's insects. <coughs> so be sh if, you're trying to, if you're looking, if you want to identify things, um, on my website, all the pictures in all my books are on my website for you, and they're all labeled all of diseases and insects and even the beneficial insects as well. So you can use that any time to get an identification because once you know what you're looking at, there's lots of information about life cycle, what to do about it, you know, things like that. So the problem is looking at websites for Missouri or the UK, you get, you get really sidetracked into problems that we don't have here but look similar. So I, I just write my books for this region only so start there, uh, and then you'll know that it's something that we actually have here. <clears throat> I'll just, you know, I, I put this in for all my talks, just for people to remember that if it's flying around your field or your garden in the daytime, there's only one species that's a pest, and everything else you see is not a pest. So which one do you think is the pest that flies around? White butterfly. That white cabbage mm -hmm. butterfly. I hate yeah, you yeah. my worst enemy. Yeah. That's it. That's the only one. If you see anything else flying during the day in your garden, I can't think of any other species it could be that, 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 that would be a pest. So you can rest assured that there's an army of creatures. Um, these are all parasites. This is a parasite of aphids. This is eats mosquitoes. This eats aphids. This eats aphids. This eats other insects. That eats white flies, aphids. This is eating caterpillars. That's a pollinator. That's a pollinator, and that's a parasite of caterpillars. So they're all got things to do, and they just look like flies and butterflies and bugs, right? Mm -hmm. So, how does people see this on the soil? This yes. is what? Is that a wire room? No, what is that? No, that yes! One. She fell for it! <laughs> you know what it is? Oops. It's a wireworm predator. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. This is the hole that just punched into the wire. There's the wireworm. But of course, they look just like wireworms. And they're found where the wireworms are, but they're cream colored. They're always cream colored. Wireworms are various shades of gold and tan and stuff. But stiletto flies, I love that name. Because yeah. they poke right through the wireworm. And they're not, um, I mean, they're pretty common. They're not uncommon at all. I mean, most people have actually seen these, but just thought they were wireworms. Yeah. So this is why it's really important to know what, what you're looking at. Well, if they're dirty, they go, they would look. It'd be harder to differentiate. Well, they're shiny like wireworms, and the dirt falls off. But if they're cream colored, they're not no. wireworms. So and really, you have to go by color. You can just buy those and then just sprinkle them around. No, them. no, <laughs> no, no. Nice try. There's almost no biocontrols that you can buy that are that are actually going to be useful outdoors. Uh, I, I used to work for a company that raised them, but they're all for the big greenhouses. You know, because they're really simple ecosystems. You know, and you can get, you get white flies, you put in a white fly parasite. Mm -hmm. You get spider mites, you put in the spider mite predator. The spider mite predator. But none of them, those two are not pests outdoors. Uh, they're, they're greenhouse problems. Uh, and so this is just another example of like, how, how you can be really fooled. These are, this is this damage, look how weird this is. These are blister mites on pears that are so tiny, you cannot see those mites with the naked eye. You need a microscope and a good microscope. Whereas the, that, is a, that is actually fungus disease on pears and on apples. These are scab diseases. So you, know, you really do need to know what you're dealing with because the treatment for them each is quite different. What is the treatment for the scab disease on pears? On, on pears, it's the same as apples, which is get all the leaves picked up and composted in the fall. And now pears, pear scab actually also overwinters on the trees. So lime sulfur sprays help. But apple scab doesn't overwinter on the trees. There's no point putting uh, dormant sprays on for apple scab because it's not on the tree in the winter time. But it is, in the case of pears, you will get some of it. But the best control is also 
to get rid of the composted leaves because the, the spores are overwintering on the leaves. And if the leaves are shredded, I mean, you can just, in bigger orchards, you could just mow until the leaves are shredded, as long as they're decomposed by spring and not lying there kind of intact so that the um, spores can spring up in the, in the spring. So this is my point that I made earlier. Most plant problems are disorders. So up, you know, half to three quarters of the samples going into labs, they turn out not to be insects or diseases. Here's blossom end rot again. This is what happens to potatoes when the irrigation system packs it in for three weeks. This is uh, bitter pit again in apples. So um, all kinds of things, but not pests. So a quick chart just to you know, tell a disorder from a disease, because plant damage can look so similar. As I said earlier, if it's limited to one variety or one plant family, it could be a disease. If it's all over a lot of unrelated plants, it's not disease. You may or may not see spores, but uh, uh, plants that are infected, usually the, uh, the um, organism, the, the pathogen, can at attacks the oldest leaves first. Plants have a lot of ability to resist infection in their leaves, but they reserve that for their young leaves. You know, that's the leaves that have the full spectrum of, of infection resistance, um, whether it's uh, chemicals or whatever in the leaf. Uh, whereas damage, if it was uh, too hot or something wrong with the nutrients, it happens quick to all of them at once. Um, now damage from sun scald or uh, you see salt spray damaging, um, you know, crops that are really close to the shore and a high, after a high, high wind storm. It'll be really directional. It'll be all ages of leaves, young leaves, middle leaves, and old leaves. will be all injured at the same time. And diseases don't do that. They, they usually attack the old leaves first, but they don't hit the plant all at once in this kind of, it's very obvious it looks like something has come from the side. Or, um, and then the damage will keep going usually it may go slowly but if if it's a disorder the new growth will be fine because if you can as soon as you fix the conditions or the weather gets better no problem so knowing what the weather's been is a good clue to both of them because the weather will tell you has it been uh, weather that certain particular diseases might like or sun scald or whatever so you you need to you know, kind of remember I, keep, I have to keep records of weather because I don't remember what the weather was <coughs> two days ago. We have seen a lot of sun scald. We, as coastal gardeners, now the Alberni Valley has always gotten hot in the summer, but where I live on Salt Spring or when I was you know, out along the coast here, this is kind of new for us to uh, even know what sun scald looks like. It's like two years ago when they had to use so much salt in Vancouver. In the spring, nobody knew what salt injury looked like. If you live in Ontario, everybody knows what salt injury looks like on your plants and your lawns, but nobody in Vancouver, all these big brown spots in their lawns and stuff, and it was salt damage because they never use that kind of salt usually in the, in the winter in Vancouver. But this is a, an injury on fruit. Um, this, is, this is a raspberry leaf that was uh, in a heat wave very, uh, I think the first week of May, very, very hot and doing this tip injury. Typical of sun scald or, or heat injury is that the injury is between the veins and on the outer, the edges of the leaf that are farthest from the veins where the, the liquid is flowing in the plant. When you think about it, that's logical, right? Is that just the heat or is that? Yeah, it's the heat and, well, heat and drought together because remember if the plant closes a stomata, suddenly they, so they can work together. Is it like an increase in UV rays? Well, you know, um, yes, if you take something out of a greenhouse, um, say it's been under glass and it hasn't had full spectrum, it goes outside you can get a very severe burn, but now in that case, it's not because of the moisture not making it, it's the cells are just don't have the sunscreen chemicals, and the injury in that case can be anywhere on the leaf and even on the stem. And that happens to cucumbers. You take cucumbers out of a glass greenhouse, put them in but the field. Is it because more um, ultraviolet radiation is getting through the atmosphere? Well, that can be, actually, interestingly, that, that has been a problem in the past. The ozone hole was patching itself up, though. It's less of a problem. When I was a kid, you used to pull onions out and cure them on the ground in the summertime. And now you never do that because there's too much solar radiation. You will burn the onions. You will actually damage the fruit skin. So you have to cure them in the shade. So that can be an effect from, you know, something that we did 50 years ago compared to now. 
but it's not part of the climate change picture. But it certainly is an issue if you take plants out of any protected cultivation and pop them straight into full sun. You need to get them, it's just like people getting a tan, you have to get them used to it. Because the plants don't make sunscreen chemicals in their cells if they don't need it, because it takes energy to do that. So they're not gonna do anything they don't need. Uh, so, but they will build it up, they'll just, it, you know, you take a, take a week and let them be in the sun for an hour and two hours, or put them under shade for the first few days, or plant them and then shade them so that they get used to the sun. It's just like getting a tan, exactly. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to see this picture. This is sun, sun. This is heat injury on raspberries, and they've all these little droplets have all just turned tan because they're they're dead. But you see, some are start turning gray now. Yeah. That's botrytis moving in to to the fungus that attacks tissue that's dead and injured. <coughs> um, oh boy, look at those. Well, they're certainly interesting. <laughs> interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, so if, if the person that sent me this picture had taken the picture about three days later, what I would have thought was that her raspberries were from botrytis, because I wouldn't have seen this. So it's a little bit of a detective job, like you need to be on top of the weather and stuff, because this is, uh, they're about to go. They're going to all be fungusy and disgusting.